to start with a fragment from a police adjective. I want you to listen for noises and animals. Actually, less silent than you would think. Okay, I'll stop it here. Um, in and oh, we'll come back to it. Uh, in 1924, in a new Romanian magazine called Cinema, Cinema, an article urged potential filmmakers to contribute to the development of national cinema, arguing that I quote, "We have beautiful landscapes, forests, and mountains." End of quote. The beautiful landscapes being thus presented as the perfect raw material, the key ingredient for movies. As a parenthesis, the same article supported the creation of historical movies based on the fact that since we have many young people in the military, we could easily have good and cheap extras. About a decade later, a magazine called Picturesque Romania, Romania Pitoresca, started presenting and advertising for various Romanian landscapes. Its title was borrowed from a 1901 book by Alexandru Vlahuta, Romania Pitoresca, a work for which the author had received the Romanian Academy Award. This work appears as a natural addition to other efforts to define Romanian national identity through the picturesque. At the 1889 Universal Exposition in Paris, after many hesitations motivated by political complications and financial difficulties, Romania participated with what the general audience saw more like a surprise, une exposition ethnographique et pittoresque, according to Le Petit Journal, an ethnographical and picturesque exhibit. Uh, of course, besides this, uh, most geography textbooks from the 19th century to basically nowadays talk about the unique beauty and variety of the Romanian landscape. For instance, a 1939 third grade geography textbook not only praised the picturesque of our landscapes, but supported its assertions with quotes from romantic poets like Alexandri and Kozbuk. And of course, one cannot forget the fact that philosophers like Lucian Blaga and others too proposed to link Romanian soul to what they considered a very specific, beautiful and harmonious landscape with rolling hills, green pastures, lush forests and spectacular rivers. 
Anne-Marie Thiès in her The Creation of National Identities based on Hobsbawm's uh, invention of tradition explained that the 18th and 19th century invention of national identities was a process similar to putting together um, IKEA furniture. There are some variations, but also some required parts, and the process is similar for basically all nations. Some of the necessary ingredients being an anthem, even if it's borrowed from somewhere else, from a different nation, maybe, but not always, a language, some heroes, some customs, even if common to other nations, costumes, traditions. For the Romanians, she noted the importance of the language, Romanian as a Romance language, ancient history with the Romans and the Dacians, and last but not least, uh, of various ethnographic and picturesque elements. It is then no wonder that in a movie from the 80s, from the Magellato series, uh, there is a character representing a German traveler uh, who looks around from an elevated point as the camera sweeps across a panoramic view of mountains, deep valleys, and clear skies, and he exclaims admiringly, like an, in an advertisement for the tourism office, schöne Landschaft, beautiful landscape. In a very unsubtle way, the 19th century German admiring the Romanian landscape is obviously supposed to symbolize German tourists visiting the usual tourist landmarks of communist and not only Romania. Mountains, monasteries, seaside, Danube, which have become some sort of cliches. Um, to uh, illustrate again Anne-Marie's assertion that there is nothing more international than the creation of national identities, we can uh, mention Pinta, uh, a Romanian film from 1977, where the spectacular uh, mountainous landscape is actually a copy uh, of the uh, similar spectacular mountainous landscape uh, from 1969, um, Butchka City and the Sundance Kid. Similarly, many other Romanian movies from the 70s and 80s did not miss, um, okay, um, did not miss the opportunity to <coughs> include painterly landscape, breathtaking views of uh, the Carpathians, the Danube or the sea, bucolic images of sheep grazing on green hills, romanticized images uh, looking like postcards and tourist information brochures, um, or imitating some of Nicolae Grigorescu's paintings. Um, like this one. Um, as it started in the 20s, the idea of movies as tourism advertisement continues throughout the end of the 80s. Um, such panoramic views are obviously far from the often narrow, dark, drab, sometimes suffocating spaces in many Romanian contemporary movies. Many of the recent Romanian movies share the way they deal with space, more precisely, with a cityscape and suburban landscape. In an interview about his recent book, Très Cher Cinéma Français, Eric Neuhoff complained about what he considered the presence of an abstract, artificial, atemporal Paris in and cliché Paris in many recent French films, explaining that the cityscape in most of these movies had been purged of many characteristic details of a contemporary Paris, such as he mentioned electric scooters or multi-ethnic elements. We can say that the absence of such details is definitely not something that could be reproached to Romanian contemporary cinema, so minutely detailed in metonymical signs of contemporary Romania, with political or obscene graffiti on the walls, elements of social or economic change, 24-7 stores, flickering street lights, a mix of communist buildings with peeling plaster and crippled doors and post-communist shopping malls, cosmopolitan cafes, building made of steel and glass, streets with old Dacia and new expensive cars. 
but I would like now to address another aspect that is the soundscape and sound collage and the way the sound interacts with image in these movies. Uh, I gave the example of Radu Jude's short Tube with a Hat as a plethora of nature sounds starts being heard even as the screen is still black. Kind of similar to the way such sounds started in police adjective. Um, one can suddenly hear geese honk and there are sparrows chirping, dogs barking, breaking the silence that precedes the first images on the screen. Usually, these animal sounds um, have a source that cannot be seen, with very rare exceptions of, uh, for instance, a couple of dogs in some movies, or the pigeons in uh, um, Radu Jude's uh, happiest, The Happiest Girl in the World. The sources of these background sounds, that is the animal sounds, uh, almost in almost all Romanian contemporary movies remain invisible. And actually, although seen in The Happiest Girl in the World, the pigeons cannot be heard. The city or suburb sounds uh, that precede the images or any action on the screen can be heard in an almost overwhelming way in several movies, like the case of Porumboyu's police adjective that we've just listened to, or Mungiu's graduation and many others. In Voice in Cinema, Michel Chion explains, and I quote, a film oral's, uh, oral's elements are not receives, received as an autonomous unit. They are immediately analyzed and distributed in the spectator's perceptual apparatus according to the relation each bears to what the spectator sees at the time. First and foremost, according to whether you see in the image the source attributed to the sound, for example, if words are heard, whether or not you see the person who's speaking, it's from this instantaneous perceptual triage that certain audio elements, essentially those referred to as synchronous, uh, that is, whose apparent source is visible on screen, can be immediately swallowed up in the image's false depth or relegated to the periphery of the visual field, but on alert to appear if there's a sound whose cause is temporarily put off screen. But as we saw you know, earlier, uh, in many of the movies and, and, in, and in many of the movies that we will i will discuss now the nature sounds of the cityscape uh, are easily ignored uh, or can remain undecoded um, many opening scenes are preceded and sometimes accompanied for a short time uh, by such sounds um, during the first minutes of police adjective I hope that you could hear, if you know, we pay attention, we could probably um, identify them. Um, some crows, sparrows, blackbirds, starlings, pigeons, seagulls, that's six bird calls, and some dogs, two kinds of dogs, like a bigger dog in the beginning and a smaller dog later. I'm no ornithologist. I uh, assume that you know, I identified them correctly, but anyway, so they're at least I would say six different bird calls. Um, so the um, the fact that um, these uh, these animals are you know, their voices of these animals uh, are so present, and we'll see that this is the case of many other movies uh, cannot be ignored. Um, so we have all these details that we can recognize as uh, um, typical of Romanian cities. You know, we can even hear now, you know, some sirens um, and the omnipresent sound of barking dogs, for instance, beeping of car alarm alarms. You know, I I had in my text ambulance sirens. We just had that to illustrate my you know, presentation. And even the swishing sound of the street sweeper brushing and hissing and rushing uh, as uh, he lazily pushes dead leaves, ice cream wrappers, or empty cigarette packs. And uh, so all this is to be heard if we pay attention. 
in conjunction with many urban or suburban images. Um, as a parenthesis, we have to admit that Romanian urban and suburban areas can be quite noisy. There's always also some remodeling or construction going on. Um, and, uh, you know, stray dogs barking, urban seagulls making what ornithologists call the choking calls. And even here last night, um, you know, next to my hotel from, you know, midnight until well after 2 a.m., um, there were incredibly many construction noises, uh, I guess a sign of uh, an ever-evolving Romania. The new cityscape or suburban landscape of, uh, often features mud, moisture, and puddles. Uh, it's as if we were witnessing the beginning of life, and we can see things woos and drip. Um, walls that seem to um, announce the arrival or, or the return of the simplest forms of life, the simplest plants, uh, lichens, fungi, all kinds of weeds, uh, undistinguishable bryophytes, liverworts and hornworts, as these are some of the uh, primitive weeds with a very ba basic root system and leaf system and moss. So we can see the moisture uh, on the ground in, uh, uh, in this image and also moisture kind of like, you know, oozing from the walls and creeping up into the walls. Uh, the fauna of the urban jungle has hidden animals uh, or forms of life. They are there, they can be heard or anticipated, but they cannot be seen. So the suburb streets are like petri dishes with bacteria and mold that are thriving, eating the walls, the sidewalks, the foundations. Nature in these movies appears as a source of decay. Uh, it is a parasitical form of life. Um, since buildings appear as ruins, uh, they don't have anything of the nature-civilization relationship that one can see in the romantic representations of ruins. Nature represents here something that takes over urban or suburban life, uh, grows out of control, ends up everywhere as the presence of decay in the living. In it, um, it is as if we could see the persistence of geological strata, the persistence of residues of a non-assimilated past. Um, the cityscape or suburban landscape are non-homogeneous, and nature is not the beautiful uh, nature, but something that takes over this uh, current, uh, you know, present life. It colonizes, spreads, and cannot be eradicated. So this, these are some more examples of puddles, mud, muck, and you know, moisture and humidity. And then, um, and here we have you know, these uh, layers, almost looking that like those geological strata that I mentioned, with all kinds of weeds and moss and uh, uh, mold uh, growing you know, upwards on this wall. In a scene from graduation, the father goes back to where the attack had taken place, and we can see him almost eaten by, this, by the wild vegetation. Overwhelmed, the character starts sobbing uncontrollably, but his sobs are accompanied and almost covered by the sounds of thousands of invisible crickets and barking dogs. We can barely see him and we can hardly see him uh, because of the, you know, the presence of this nature and of these nature sounds. Um, at the beginning of the movie, we can see a hole being dug out by an invisible being, by somebody. Um, of course, we can assume that it's some worker from a plumbing company, but that person is not seen. We just see the hole, and that makes us also think of a grave. And we can hear the thud of the, bird, of the dirt being shoveled out. A few moments later, so this is the hole, and a few moments later, a hostile nature erupts brutally in a threatening way 
in Romeo Alda's house under the form of a rock. It could come from the grave-like hole being dug out that we saw earlier. A, a rock that breaks Romeo's window, pushing the curtain away. We hear the sound of the broken glass, but we will never see who throws the rocks, just like we don't see who is digging that hole, and we don't see the dogs barking or the birds chirping. As if trying to resist the intrusion of this threatening nature, Romeo keeps listening to Purcell and Vivaldi's Baroque music in his car. We know that the Baroque wanted to illustrate the power of man over nature, and we may see Romeo almost obsessively listening to, these, to this music as if to erase or block the encroaching, intrusive, parasitical, dark nature. In a very critical review of graduation, Richard Brody claims that Munju could have explored many more details indicating the endemic corruption of the Romanian society. So he basically said that Munju should have or could have uh, um, made this movie differently. And I quote, there is an unrealized, unattempted, potentially audacious movie implicit in the contrived pseudo-realism of graduation, one that would have allowed Munju to decry and detail from a personal perspective the corruption that he finds endemic and in unendurable in modern Romanian life. He could have filmed from the window of a car as he drove through the town, for instance, or filmed some battered hallways and visited some offices and poked into the living rooms and bedrooms of his friends while he mused loud and long on the soundtrack about the degradations of Romanian life. He could have even sat at a table across from a friend or the camera and done as much. This kind of direct address may well have given him ideas and observations of a more vivid and absorbing cinematic identity than does the ready-made and pre-packaged packaged fictional incarnation. In any case, the possible strategies and style for doing so are far greater than these examples, and the search for a form for his subject would have been a greater source of drama than the story itself said Richard Brody about graduation. Michael Brook has a rather opposite view of Munju's film. The title of his article is Graduation offers a riveting look at a rotten system. And I think that you know, the word rotten is, a, is very appropriate here uh, because it talks about this idea of decay and of decaying nature, of microorganism and some form of you know, parasitical life that are destroying something. Uh, Christian Munju's fourth feature tells a cautionary tale of petty corruption in Romania, and Brooke explains, aside from occasional snippets of car radio opera and a pop song over the end of, credit, of the credits, uh, end credits. Uh, there is no conventional music soundtrack in Christian Munju's fourth, fourth solo feature. There is, however, a near continuous cacophony of rings, chirrups, buzzes, and thrums, as almost every scene is interrupted by a phone, sometimes answered, often ignored. Since the majority of the film is made up of conversations between two or three people, usually hushed for fear of being overheard, this constant reminder of modern life's relentless interconnectedness acts as a potent metaphor for its central theme, that of the impossibility of achieving desi desired outcomes in a complete vacuum. In this environment, actions always have consequences, often decidedly unwanted and even potentially career reputation and life-threatening. So Brooks sees the metaphorical dimension of Munju's movie, but I would like to add that, um, first of all, we, um, it's not just any uh, opera that uh, the character is listening to. He's listening to St uh, Stabat Mater uh, and to Purcell's Cold Song. Both songs are about death, 
like, you know, so the last one is basically about like, you know, freezing, being frozen to death, preferring, preferring to be left, uh, you know, to die, to freeze to death. And of course, you know, the Stab Vivaldi Stabat Mater is about, again, you know, death, pain and suffering. And I would also like to add the fact that the rings, the chirps and the buzzes are not only produced by phones or uh, mo modern electronic devices. Because in Mungiu's movie, nature and culture collide, but not in a Rousseauist way. Um, there are nature sounds, like the calling and chirping and buzzing of birds and insects, as well as sounds of things that are somehow alive um, or become alive, like streets and sidewalks. Because streets and sidewalks are wet, muddy, sticky, gooey, and the character's shoes make squishy sounds as if trapped for a fraction of a second, glued to, you know, by the mud on the ground. In the scene where Romeo goes to the place um, of the attack and starts sobbing, um, the bushes um, that almost swallow him. So he's here, but you know, so we can sort of hear him, um, but not really, you know, so we can see the light, but that's about all we can see of Romeo. Uh, in the scene where he goes to the place of the attack and he starts sobbing, the bush that swallows him uh, is like an immense, like an immense carnivorous plant. Romeo can barely be seen, and his sobs are covered, almost ironically, by the thousands of crickets and by the many barking dogs. In Mungiu, Porumboyu's, or Radu Jude's, or Marianne Christian's films set in urban settings, cars, car engines stalling sound like they have a strep throat, and buildings look like lepers. Primitives form, primitive forms of mold and moss seem to gradually invade them, creeping, creeping up from the ground or from the inside. Everything seems to be inhabited by some forms of or organisms, which could remind us of shipwrecks where objects and artifacts become the passive hosts of algae or other forms of sea life. We could also think of uncanny surrealist images uh, of nature and culture, where insects, mollusks, and nematodes um, are not just the persistence of memory, but the persistence of a um, hybrid space where signs of an undigested and undead past and its living fossils are revealed and they contaminate and haunt us as form of phagocytes and parasites. Thank you.